This is Dr. Ken with a lecture for my Ancient Greece class, though in the great spirit of Democratic Athens, anyone who wishes is welcome to watch it. Um, the topic today I'm titling Politics and People, the Athenian Experience. Um, and I'll be going through the political development of Athens from its, the earliest days of history and, and mytho-history, I should add, um, that we can attest uh, up to the democratic period. So, um, firstly, uh, we need to talk about the evolution of the Athenian polis, polis being the word for city-state, um, and, and it derives from a Mycenaean settlement, so we know that there was someone there in the Bronze Age, and that the Acropolis Hill uh, was where that Mycenaean palace would have been situated. Um, and, and probably the original town itself, although there may have, the settlement may have extended around it, but if we, if we go by Mycenae um, <clears throat> on the plain of Argos, then we expect most of the settlement to have been within the walls of, of that citadel. What caused uh, it to become a, a polis in, in the sense that we, that we think we understand? Well, it's a complex process. After the Mycenaean um, collapse, there would have still been some kind of settlement there uh, and, and probably a number of villages surrounding it in, in the territory of Attica. Uh, and and from this, um, through a process called Sunoikism that, that seems to have mostly taken place, <clears throat> pardon me, between the Archaic and uh, sorry, between the Dark Ages and the Archaic Ages, these different villages came together under uh, one kind of leadership, and, and the organization of society at that at that stage appears to have been tribal, um, so based on tribal chieftains who, who would then go on to become aristocrats and the tribal chieftains and the tribes continue to persist until the democratic period. Initially Athens probably had kings. It's unclear precisely when that, that ceased to be the case. Though we'll talk about the last king of Athens in a few minutes. Um, and throughout much of archaic age, well probably dark age and archaic age history, it would have had an oligarchic council governing it. Um, and it, it moves then from oligarchy to democracy, and that's its peculiar response to the crises that faced the Greek world in about the 6th century BC, starting arguably in the 7th, um, where there were destabilizing factors in a number of city-states. Uh, so we'll go through that process in a little bit more detail and talk about the age of kings, first of all. Uh, when is this age of kings? Well, it's mostly around the time of the the Bronze Age, um, or at least those are the, the sort of dates, you know, that, that the Athenians' sources attest to. I'm not going to go through all the kings. I've put them in the um, in the notes for people to see, uh, and some of them are, are just kings of Athens. Some of them are kings of Attica, the wider region around it. Um, I'll just mention a couple of them. So one is called Kekrops, who's considered to be the, the founder and first king of Athens itself. Um, and, and he's one of these, these mythical figures who seems to have been, well, is, is, is described as being something like part snake um, and having connections with the gods. Um, then there's Erechthonius and Erechtheus. Erechtheus is an archaic king of Athens, again, archaic I, I should is perhaps the wrong term he's more if he existed he's a bronze age one um, and it, the, the palace the, the erechtheion which is a temple um, currently on the acropolis and was was a temple in, in the classical age was possibly the, the king's palace but named after him um, athens thought of themselves as the Erechtheidae, the sons of Erechtheus. And in Homer's Iliad, um, he is the son of the grain-giving earth, having been reared by the goddess Athena. So this is mytho-history, obviously. These are stories, mythical stories, connected with these gods. The earth-born son was sired by Hephaestus, um, whose semen Athena wiped from her thigh with a fillet of wool and cast to the earth, by which Gaia then became pregnant. Um, and that's where Erechtheus, who springs from the soil, from the earth, comes about. 
um, and and in the contest of patronship for patronship of Athens between Poseidon and Athena, the salt spring on the Acropolis where Poseidon's trident struck is known as the Sea of Erechtheus. So there are these myths associated with him. I'm not going to go over over all of them again, but I will mention um, Aegeus and Theseus. These are um, mythical kings of some import. And of course, in the democratic period, the Athenians regard the you know kings as a bad thing generally. But uh, there seems to have been some sort of agreement that there were a couple of good kings of Athens, or at least one, well, two, certainly Theseus and Cadmus, whom we'll come to in a bit. But um, Aegeus was the father of Theseus. And there's this whole mythical tale of how King Minos of, uh, uh, of, of Crete was, was slighted by, well, well, the, the story goes that while visiting in Athens, King Minos' son uh, managed to defeat Aegeus in every contest during the Panathenaic Games. Out of jealousy, Aegeus sent him to conquer the uh, Marathonian bull, a mythical wild bull that killed him. Minos was angry and declared war on Athens. He offered them peace, however, under the condition that Athens would send seven young men and seven young women uh, every nine years to Crete to be fed to the Minotaur, a vicious monster. Turns out the Minotaur was the offspring of King Minos' wife um, and, um, and a bull. Uh, possibly Zeus in the form of a bull, but at any rate, a monster that lived in this maze. And um, it probably what this myth recollects is something to do with the, the, the power of the Minoan civilization um, and the sort of power it influence exerted over the mainland of Greece. <clears throat> the, the Minotaur's maze might well be the palace of King Minos because at the time it would have been one of the most sophisticated structures for any, that any Greek would have been aware of. So possibly that's what it alludes to. So there's this arrangement thanks to uh, this, this, this jealousy of Aegeus. He, he brings it upon himself, his hubris, brings upon Athens this um, this unfortunate situation. But his son Theseus decides he wants to put an end to this 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 horrible sacrifice of, of young people. So pardon me. Um, Theseus is, is a kind of a typical hero uh, king. He's he's associated with the Sunoikismos, the, the, the living together, the combining of villages as well. And that may well be historical. Uh, but he also has, there, there are a number of stories about him uh, defeating various monsters and, and villains who um, plagued Athens at the time. And I put these in the notes, the heroic deeds of Theseus, as, as they're sometimes referred to. Uh, so he's a hero king uh, who, who, you know, fixes problems and, 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 and I'll go over just a couple of these. So. One of the more famous has to do with a bandit named Procrustes, the stretcher, who had two beds, one of which he offered to passers-by on the plain of Eleusis in his house. He then made, it, made them fit into it, either by stretching them, if they were too short, or by cutting off their feet. Um, since the two beds were of different lengths, no one would actually ever fit it. Theseus turned the tables on Procrustes, uh, though it's not said whether he cut Procrustes to size or stretched him to fit, so he, he essentially tricked him and put an end to his banditry. So this, this bandit was um, taking advantage of travelers and you know, robbing them and, and, and causing them grievous bodily harm. There are a number of other examples as well of him fighting um, robbers or, 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 or other or monsters in some cases. <clears throat> and then this, you know, this has mythic resonances. It might also refer to actual events involving a king you know, named Theseus, who, who is a real person. But what goes on with the Minotaur? Um, so the story goes, Theseus has volunteered to sail uh, with the, the, the seven youths and or seven young men and seven young women to to to, to Crete. Um, and on his arrival, Ariadne, the daughter of King Minos, falls in love with him, and this is presumably through this, through the action of the goddesses, goddess of Aphrodite. And she helps him with a ball of thread that he uses to navigate the maze and gives him a sword, which he then uses to slay the Minotaur. 
Um, so that, that's, that's a pretty important um, thing. And then he escapes. He takes her with him, but, um, but then uh, he, he, on the island of Naxos, he's commanded by the god Dionysus to, um, to hand over Ariadne. Uh, and, and it, well, we're told this is this is what we're told. Um, so the god Dionysus appeared to Theseus and told him that, that he had already chosen Ariadne for his bride, and to abandon her on Naxos, a favored island. Ariadne then cursed Theseus to forget to change the black sail to white on his ship. Um, so it, this is a case of where Theseus, and I'll explain why that's important. Uh, Theseus is compelled by a god within his beloved Ariadne, who loves him, who's been made magically to fall in love with him, curses him. And of course, the, the royal family of, of Crete are all descended from the gods anyway, so her curse has power. Um, and he was meant to, if he, if he was successful in his, in, in, his, in his quest, he would change the sail on the ship from black to white, showing he's bringing back you know, the 14 youths and himself alive. Um, but he forgets to do this because of the curse. And so when King Agia sees the ship coming with black sails, uh, he, he's so downhearted, so depressed that he casts himself um, off, the, it's off the rock of the Areopagus, in fact, which will come up in a few, few minutes, into the sea. And, and he gives his name to the sea. It's from the death of the, the suicide of King Aegeus that we get the Aegean Sea. Aegean Sea. So Theseus is, is an important king um, and, and considered not a bad one. So this brings me to the last king of Athens that I'll talk about, uh, Codrus, whose, whose dates, if, if they are to be believed, um, sort of come after or roughly around the time of, uh, or maybe about two centuries after the end of the Bronze Age, suggesting that this is the last time that Athens had a king. Um, and the story goes that the Dorians, these are the ancestors of the Spartans and the Macedonians, have invaded Greece, um, and and they're but they're well invaded is maybe the wrong term. They're they're occupying Greece at any rate, um, and they're attacking Athens, and Athens may be defeated by them. But there's a prophecy. The Oracle at Delphi uh, has prophesied that their invasion would succeed so long as the king of Athens was not harmed. So the news of the prophecy that only the death of the Athenian king would ensure the safety of, of Athens quickly found its way to the ears of Codrus. Uh, in devotion to his people, Codrus disguised himself as a peasant and made it uh, to the vicinity of the Dorian encampment where he provoked a group of them to attack him. He was put to death in the quarrel. And when they realized that the, the Dorians are notoriously very religious people, when they realized what, what had happened, they retreated in fear of the prophecy. In the aftermath of these events, no, uh, no one was thought worthy enough to succeed Codrus. Um, and the title of king, well, the, the role of king at any rate, the title of king, official king, was, was, was done away with, um, although the role that the king performed would be, as we'll see, uh, undertaken by some other people, um, and his, the Archons, as they're called, and his son, Medon, who was the son of Codrus, would be the, one of the first Archons. So that's the end of kingship. Um, Codrus, the last king of Athens, considered quite an honorable individual. So uh, what comes next, and we presume this is throughout most of the Dark Ages, um, and certainly the Archaic Age, is the Areopagus, uh, which, which the Areopagus literally means the Rock of Ares. This is on the west of the northwest of the Acropolis, um, which was the location of uh, the, this this well, where the, where the government met essentially, and they, they call them the Areopagus. They're an oligarchic council, um, and so in pre-classical times, before the fifth century. They were the council of elders of the city, like a senate, we might, we might consider. Um, their history is, is largely one of, 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 of gradual reforms, but you've got to imagine who's, who's making up the Areopagus. Well, it's the elites, it's the aristocrats, um, the, the upatridae, the well-fathered ones, of which there are multiple clans. 
uh, and, and fierce competition amongst them as well. A series of reforms will be passed over time, limiting their power. Um, so by the, by the 5th century, uh, and certainly by the middle of the 5th century, they are, they're still around, but they're kind of an appendage of, of government. They, they function as a court for um, certain types of trial, as we'll see. But um, so it's, it's, it's a body of aristocratic origin that subsequently formed the higher court of, 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 of Greece. Um, and on the Areopagus, amongst their number, were the Archons. So this is a chief magistrate, and, and not just in Athens, but in, in many Greek city-states, Archons would have existed. Uh, the word itself means one who is ruling, so a ruler. Um, and it was a kind of, if it comprised a kind of executive government. From about the, we know that from about the late eighth century, uh, there were three archons in Athens: the eponymous, the polemarch, and the basileus. So the eponymous archon, amongst other things, as the, as, his, as his title suggests, uh, gave his name to the year, and this was how they recorded years. They would say in the archonship of so and so. <coughs> Pardon me. The polemarch was the um, ceremonial, uh, well, f actual for a time, head of, of, of the army, although he's replaced in 501 BC by the ten strategoi, the generals. Um, now, the polemarch still performed a vital function, but his role was, was largely symbolic later on. And the, the archon Basileos, Basileos means king, so the king archon, he's the ceremonial remnant of the Athenian aristocracy. These positions were filled from the aristocracy uh, initially by elections every 10 years amongst themselves, making Athens during that period a bit more like a republic since you've got you know, an elected leadership, although the franchise being very limited in this case. Pardon me. Um, the Archon Eponymous was the chief magistrate, polemarch, head of the armed forces, and the Basileos responsible for civic and religious arrangements. After 508 BC, the offices were held for only a single year, and the year was named, as I say, after the Archon Eponymous. Um, he presided over the meetings of the Boule, that's the upper house, we'll come to that in a bit, and the Ecclesia in the assemblies. The Eponymous remained the titular head of state, although it would be uh, inappropriate to confuse him with something like a president or prime minister. It's not, that's not really the role that, that he performed. Um, he would usually be, he would be in charge of, of, of certain events like um, the festivals and, and the, the um, competitions of the festival of Dionysus. So um, they still perform important roles and, and eventually they'll be, they'll be elected uh, through the assembly and being an archon automatically puts you on the Areopagus as well. Uh, but that, that's a bit later. Initially, they're chosen from them, and then later, under the democratic system, they're uh, added from from the, the general assembly. <clears throat> now, I'm talking about the different organs of the Athenian government um, and their evolution. Another one is the boule, from the ancient Greek word meaning will, um, and it, it's a council of citizens. Uh, appointed to run the daily affairs of the city. And originally, this would have been a council of nobles advising a king. Um, later, there are a lesser council of nobles advising the aristocrats who are in the Areopagus. Um, <clears throat> and other city-states would have had boules as well, again, made up of, of nobles. Um, in the democracy, their role is, is sort of revised. So Solon, a reformer whom we'll, we'll talk about a bit more later, uh, under his reforms, the Athenian boule heard of appeals from the most important decisions of the courts, um, although the poorest classes couldn't serve in, in, in the boule. Uh, they were made up of 400 people at that point. And the highest governmental posts at that point were also, um, this is 6th century BC, were um, from the top two income groups of citizens. <clears throat> Under Cleisthenes, a, a major reformer, and Cleisthenes is an aristocrat who, who is in, in the end of the 6th century, beginning of the 5th century, um, trying to address various internal crises in Athens. Under his reforms, 
enacted in 508 7 BC, the boule was extended to 500, 50 from each of the new 10 tribes, and this is something he would do. He would create artificial tribes called the deems um, to get rid of the old tribal system that, that had, had provoked so much conflict and bloodshed um, and, and fighting. So um, after redistricting you know, Athens, he then admits 50 from each of each artificial tribe, um, and, and eventually all property classes will be allowed in. So after the reforms of Ephialtes and Pericles in the mid-5th century, the boule took on many of the um, administrative and judicial functions that the Areopagus had formerly controlled, so powers being stripped away from the Areopagus given to the boule. These are part of the democratic reforms. It, it doesn't happen overnight. It's a long pros process that spans about a century, <clears throat> more than that. Um, the new boule, the democratic boule, supervised the state's finances, the navy, the cavalry, sacred matters, building and shipping matters, care for, for invalids and orphans, uh, so welfare. It, its members were, were, were staffed, uh, also staffed many boards that oversaw the finer points of, of administrative duties. So committees are formed from the boule. Um, it set the assembly, sorry, it set the, the, the schedule for the assembly as well. So all matters are discussed in the assembly. I'm coming to that next. Um, it was the boule that, that sort of decided what they were going to talk about. So a kind of governing force over the assembly or, or imposing a bit of order on them. Um, at some point in the late 5th century, pay was instituted for those serving in the boule. Uh, this would have been encouraged to encourage those citizens who couldn't perhaps afford to devote their time to democratic politics and government to be able to do that. Previously, it wasn't a, a paid position at all. It, you were expected as your duty, duty as a citizen to do it, but of course that meant <clears throat> that only those citizens who could afford to spend time away from whatever you know, means of making money they had um, could actually attend it. And that, and that tended to be then uh, the elderly uh, and, and the rich. So that the instituting pay for, for Boule members extended its, 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 you know, the franchise in some ways who could attend it. <clears throat> Next is the Ecclesia or Assembly. So you might think of the Boule as the upper house um, and then the Ecclesia as, as the assembly as, as the lower house. Um, it, it means, it, 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 it's, it's characterized um, as a sort of part of the golden age of democracy. And a lot of cities had ecclesias, um, it means something like coming together to, to, to govern. Um, in Sparta, they've got one, it's called the Appella, but they have no real official function. So it wouldn't have been unusual, even in aristocratic states, to have assemblies of the people usually gathered together to be informed of decisions made by their betters. Um, we know that the Macedonians, for example, uh, had assemblies of soldiers, and it was only the soldiers who could attend because they defended the state. They had to acclaim the new king and, and usually had to acclaim whatever he uh, decreed as well. So limited role in, in other assemblies. When Athens, um, the assembly gets to decide pretty much everything, <clears throat> including indirectly voting for the members of the Areopagus. Um, so the assembly is made up of every adult male citizen, and we're talking about it from the golden age of Athens, about 4, 480 BC to 404. Um, it's made up of around, well, we don't know precisely how many citizens, but it's estimated that, you know, about 43,000 people, maybe. Um, now, in practice, most of those, and this is adult male citizens over about the age of 18, um, we don't think that they all came together at once, um, or about many people did. A quorum of 6,000 was required, so at least 6,000 people had to be there. Um, and they chose by lot from their number uh, the members of the boule, the 500. So um, there are elements of voting, but there are also elements of, of, of random chance, and random chance remembers letting the gods have their say. Um, a gang of slaves called Scythians, and, and they might have been Scythians, they weren't always, these were foreign slaves uh, who performed the role of, of the police force. They were archers, 
armed archers uh, who, who were the state's police force. They would carry ropes dipped in red ochre, red paint, um, travel through the city on the days that the ecclesia was to meet. Any citizen that they found who wasn't attending, they would spatter with red paint. Um, and with the, their clothes and, and skin so spattered, they weren't allowed to conduct any business at all that day until they had gone and attended the assembly. So it was a kind of, uh, not carrot, but stick approach to get people to engage in democracy. So if they weren't at, at the assembly meeting on the Penix Hill, uh, then they were um, discouraged from going out of doors at all. The next slide that you see um, illustrates an outline of how the government worked. Now, this is a complex beast. I don't need to tell you that. Um, and you can look at this more um, in your own time. But you can see the court systems. You can see the different assemblies. Um, you know, and the entire citizen body, adult male citizen body, makes up the assembly, which has effectively final say over all matters. But then you see the other various organs of the government, including the boule and, and the areopagus. The areopagus, which is an appendage of its former self, but still around, still performing a function as a kind of jury trial, still performing ceremonial roles. It's an honor to be, you know, in, in, in the areopagus, but it's no longer um, the ruling oligarchic council of the city. And the aristocrats haven't gone away, by the way. Uh, they're still very much around. Um, and so we'll let you digest the Athenian political system. We'll talk about it a bit more in the seminar because it is complicated for the first democracy. It's a very complicated system. Uh, but it, you know, for them, it, it worked for, for a while at any rate. So next we'll talk about um, the Agora. Uh, and you can see a map of it there, uh, which was the beating heart of Athens. There's a video on the slideshow, which if you, if you play the slideshow, you can you can access. But it's um, it's it's the center of Athens. It's where the government, many of the governmental uh, buildings are. It's where many courtrooms are. It's also where commerce and trade would have taken place as well. So it's it's down the hill from the Acropolis. It's it's right at the foot of the Acropolis. Um, and you know, just below the places where the assembly meets and the other offices of state, it's, it's also the route through which the, the sacred festivals, like the Panathenaic, the All Athens Festival, or the Dionysian Festival, uh, would process on the, on those days that they were taking place. Next, I'll talk about the Athenian class system, um, starting with. The ones who consider themselves the best. These are the upatridae, the, the well-fathered ones, literally good-fathered, offspring of noble fathers, well-born. Uh, and this refers to the ancient nobility of, of, of the Greek region of Attica. Um, and again, tradition ascribes their origin to Theseus, whom it also regards the author of the, of the Union, the Sunoikism of Attica under Athens. Um, and as I say, these these eupatridae um, all claim to be autochthonous, which means that they, they sprang from the earth, a bit like King, uh, King Erechtheus. So th there's, th there's this sense of they're connected permanently with the land. Um, and they dominated the government for, for many centuries, uh, from, from the, the end of the Bronze Age really onwards. But the political history of the eupatridae is that of gradual curtailment of privilege. <clears throat> they were probably at their height um, uh, of power in the period during the limitation of the monarchy, so from the, the death of Codrus onwards, uh, when the Areopagus largely ruled. Um, and they, they alone held, as I said, the offices of, of, of Archon, which initially were just the Polemarch um, and the Basileus. Uh, and, and, and dur during the 8th century BC, they restrict the powers of the kings, we think. So Codrus may not have actually been the last king of Athens, if his dates are correct. We're not entirely sure, but you know, what, what constitutes a restricted monarchy? So is, is it 
you don't have hereditary kings anymore or you do but they're called archons this is a, a murky period of Athenian history and I wish we knew more about it um, but it, we think that in 712 BC the office of the king was thrown open to all um, aristocrats so they got to become the king archon at that point that seems to be the case so that doesn't quite square with the dates of Codrus being the last king although it's not clear what happened between Codrus and um, in this period but as I say they're a contentious lot these Eupatridae they fight amongst themselves for dominance this is what happens with elites in every century and pretty much every culture they vie for dominance um, over the government until one of them usually wins and except that in the case of Athens some Eupatridae and we're talking about Cleisthenes but he's not the only one Solon is another uh, who, who decide that for the good of Athens they should give up some of their power um, and and you know democratize the Eupatridae are still around um, they often are a vocal op opponents of the Athenian democratic system so Aristophanes the playwright we've been looking at he's uh, he, he's an aristocrat um, there are a number of others as well they're often quite critical of actions of the assembly so you might think in the democratic period there are sort of two factions there are aristocrats although again their loyalties and, and their vested interests might might switch around quite a bit and then there are democrats who sometimes come from aristocratic families so these are sort of populist politicians who are from aristocratic families like Pericles who is um, a member of the Alcmeonidae family a, a very old aristocratic family not untroubled as well in its history um, yet he's a very pro democratic individual primarily because he, he leads the democracy he's quite good at getting the assembly to vote how he wants there are also others who might be classed as just democrats who are not eupatridae but have achieved some measure of wealth and are at least as wealthy as some of the aristocrats this is the, the kind of political mix that we're talking about in Athens um, pardon me and I put more in the notes on these things for you to see the next class I'll talk about are the hippes the knights and yes they had knights um, it's a term for cavalry uh, and it was the second highest of the four Athenian property classes social classes made of men who could afford to maintain a horse a war horse um, and armor in service to the state and you might come in rank we can compare them to um, you know Roman equestrians or medieval knights um, there are they, they would have existed in some form or another uh, prior to the, the Greco-Persian Wars but um, as with many things in Athens they also end up getting democratized so um, the cavalry of Athens which was was first formed after the Greco-Persian War consisted of 300 men um, and from the Periclean period on it was it was it was it was 1200 including 200 mounted bowmen called um, Hippotoxotes who were slaves so so 200 of them were slaves of the state plus a thousand citizens of the highest uh, from the second highest property class um, and and what I mean by them being democratized so their numbers are increased but they're also subsidized by the state because it's recognized there's a need to have cavalry um, so that they when they're not they only get paid in times of war apparently but if but in times of peace the state subsidizes taking care of their horses so a subsidy for their um, for their upkeep it's still a sort of social class into itself an annual grant from the state to sustain them so it's a, it's a kind of aristocracy or, or, or nobility but but that existed it had existed in some form previously but then gets um, as I say democratized and, and, and revised under the democratic period the next class um, is the are the hoplites these are citizen soldiers but they're not every citizen so um, these are citizens who are armed as spearmen primarily they might carry short swords um, the name is derived from hoplon referring to their shield uh, the type of shield they use and, the, and they would be armored as well so they had to be free citizens 
usually individually responsible for procuring their, procuring their own armor and weapons. So it's, um, and, and in most Greek city-states, there would have been hoplites in virtually all of them, in fact. Um, they would have received at least basic military training um, and served as a standing army um, for a certain amount of time. So it's a class phenomenon. Not all citizens are hoplites, only those who can afford armor and the time to you know, take off time to train. Um, and uh, yep, so, so the exact time when hoplitic warfare was developed is uncertain. The prevailing theory is that it was established sometime between the 8th and 7th century BC when the heroic age of fighting was abandoned. The heroic age involved an aristocrat uh, sort of being, you know, driven out on the battle to the battlefield in a chariot by by his servants to fight another aristocrat who was equally you know, chauffeured out in, in his chariot. It's not quite. I'm, I'm oversimplifying things a bit. That style, you know, the Homeric sort of style of fighting, gives way to hoplitic warfare. How many hoplites were there? Well, the, the number varied over time, and in the Athenian democracy, they seem to have received some subsidy as well. Um, but say in the, by the time of the Greco-Persian Wars, Athens fielded 20,000 hoplites at, at the Battle of Marathon. So um, 20,000 out of a population of, of, of a, maybe about 40,000 plus citizens, we're not sure at that point. Um, at its height, the numbers are a bit bigger, so about 100,000 citizens, we think, in classical democratic Athens. But you know, 20,000, not too bad. There's still a minority, um, and, and you should get the sense that citizens, and we'll talk the next class, we'll talk about the demos, the people, um, they, they are citizens. Uh, not all of them are obviously going to be serving in the government or serving as hoplites or certainly being knights or anything like that. Um, so out of, out of them, a, min, a, min, a relative minority or a smaller number actually participate in the government. Um, let's say you take a quorum of 6,000 to have an assembly. So assume there's 100,000 citizens. There might be around 300,000 people in Attica during the democratic period. Those people would be, um, you know, slaves, resident aliens, foreigners, that sort of thing. I'll come back to them in a moment. Uh, the oik the metics, metoikoi. Uh, citizens who engaged politically and, and were hoplites and, and that sort of thing were a relative minority. So it's, even though it's a democracy, and it is male citizens we're talking about, it, it's, you know, it's a smaller number of people who are fully enfranchised compared to the whole population. Uh, having said that, it's estimated that in Athens, the majority of citizens uh, actually owned at least one slave, which is interesting. So slaves are the next class. Um, they were the basis of the economy. This was an agrarian economy. I actually skipped over one. I'll come back to the, the medics in a moment. Uh, but the the, um, the slaves were, were the basis of the economy. They were, they were meant to have, have never been citizens of Athens, although we know that due to the process of infant exposure, that infants who were left out essentially to die would often be picked up by slave traders and then raised and, and traded as slaves. So a lot of them probably were descended from Athenian citizens, but didn't have the pedigree, you know, the documentation to prove it. Um, still, it's, it's not slavery as we think of it in the sort of transatlantic race-based variety that, that dominated 18th and 19th century in Europe and America. Um, it, it's more almost like a level of citizenship. So they're not usually in chains. They're not usually bound. Certain slaves who are unruly or, or a danger to the public might be bound in, in chains and working in things like silver mines. But, um, but most of them weren't. Most of them had, had degrees of freedom. They were protected by law as well. They couldn't simply be killed outright and couldn't be abused. You know, they, they were less protected than citizens. But they also had the right to uh, purchase their freedom. So they could earn money in addition to you know, working for their master. If they could find a way to earn money in addition to that, they could buy their freedom. They weren't automatically citizens, though, if they did. They were freed men and women. Um, and, and, and that 
it's a different level. It's it's not the same. They're not slaves, but they're not they're not citizens either. They sort of a freed slave would would have had a, a comparable um, level of, of of enfranchisement to the metics, the metoikoi. These are foreigners who are in Athens, usually for purposes of trade. Um, a lot of the, the, the a lot of the prostitute, a lot of the higher class prostitutes, the, the hetaira, uh, would have been would have been metics. So and they they pay a special tax. They have to be registered. Um, it's it's like you know, indefinite leave to remain currently under our system. And so a freed slave would be a, a bit like a metic in some respects. Um, in terms of, of different types of slave, domestic and agrarian ones, uh, usually owned by private individuals as well as personal tutors, educated slaves to train the children. There were also state-owned or leased slaves, um, sometimes leased to the city by wealthy individuals. So you had individuals who, who, whose business it was essentially to own lots of slaves and lease them out to the state um, for, for a nice pr profit. We mentioned the, mount, the, the, bowmen, the mounted bowmen, the hippotoxotes, um, part of the cavalry, they were owned by the state, and the Scythian archers, the police force as well, state slaves. Um, we have Xenophon, an interesting, has an interesting take on, on slavery. He thought that, you know, one way to sort of shore up the economy of Athens would be to, to, to basically just give every citizen a certain number of slaves and then the state lease them from the citizens for labor. So it would be a perpetual source of income. A rather novel concept. Um, there were also state-owned uh, or leased slaves used to row triremes, the naval vessels, and this will actually come back to bite the Athenians because um, when the Spartans are engaging in their their war with the Peloponnesian War with Athens, they'll lure these slaves away from Athens by offering them their freedom if they come row ships for the Spartans. So the dependence on slavery, as I say, it's the basis of the economy. It's not slavery as we normally think of it. I'm not saying it was great. You wouldn't want to be a slave in any, any, any period, I think. But if you, if you had to be one, being a slave, especially a domestic one in ancient Athens or a bit later in ancient Rome, might not be so bad uh, compared to other varieties in more recent history. So those are the social classes in effect. It's more, it's more subtle and complex than that. You know, and you can read more about these things in your own time. I want to talk about political reformers in the time remaining. Um, some of these I've mentioned already. I'll just go over some of the, their major contributions, but you can read more about them as well. Draco um, is, is one of the more, one of the earlier important figures from about the 7th century BC. He uh, made the revolutionary step of replacing the oral code of law, the, law at that point was not written down. It was just remembered by the aristocrats and then recited when need be. He replaced it with a written code um, to be enforced only by a court. Um, unfortunately, well, or for, for, for whatever reasons, he fixed the penalty for most of the crimes listed in the code of laws as death. So this is the word where we get the, the draconian. It's where we get the origin of the word draconian. Um, where, where every penalty is death. So uh, Aristotle says the constitution formed under, under Draco when the first court code of laws was drawn up as the draconian constitution. It's said of Draco himself when asked why he had fixed the punishment of death for most offenses, answered that he considered these lesser crimes to deserve it and he had no greater punishment for more important ones. So a reformer, but a um, no, that's Plutarch who puts, I just quoted then, uh, a reformer, but uh, a harsh one. Still, um, you know, a big step, having the laws written down. If any of you end up studying Rome with me, you'll know this. You'll find out this is a, a very important step for the Romans too, and a major step, mo a move towards democracy. Because if, if you know, the aristocrats are the only ones who know what the law is, um, it firstly gives them a great deal of latitude in how they interpret it, or indeed what is the law but it keeps it out of the hands of, of everyone else. But having the laws written down, where everyone can see them, anyone who can read can see them, means that um, you know, your rights are, are sort of enshrined um, and you know what they are, as opposed to being somewhat uncertain about them. 
Solon is the next one I want to mention, um, and he's, he's quite an important figure. Um, during his, and he's, he's alive in, in the early 6th century BC, uh, during his time many Greek city-states had seen the emergence of tyrants, and so these, these tended to be opportunistic nobles, elites, who, who basically won the dominance game against other elites and, and set themselves up like kings. So for a long time, there aren't many kings in Greece. There's Sparta and, and Macedon but that, and Epirus, and that's about it. But during the 6th century, starting in the 7th century, but during the 6th century, there, there's this, this sort of crisis of, of stasis, as they call it, of civil war, which is really war between different aristocratic groups in Greek city-states, with one man usually emerging as, as supreme. Pardon me. Um, and there I put a number of examples of, of these in the notes for you to see. So you know some of the some of the tyrants as they're called, and the word tyrant in Greece, tyrannos, uh, just means king, but has a negative connotation because we get it through the Athenians and their democracy, and then so their attitude towards a tyrant is obviously going to be different than say the Spartan one. Um, Athens is faced by this problem as well. Uh, and, and it seems their solution was, well, Ar Solon gets elected eponymous archon in, uh, in about 594. Uh, um, and it's decided to just to give him essentially dictatorial power to reform the Constitution. He's, he's universally uh, approved of by all factions, which is a rare thing. Uh, and, um, and, and for this... And, and, the rivalry, the conflict between the different factions in Athens it extends beyond the nobles. It's, it's occurring at different levels of class, but along the lines of the old tribes. Here's a quote um, from a source called the Athenaeum Politeia, the Athenian constitution. It says, there was conflict between the nobles and the common people for an extended period. For the constitution they were under was oligarchic in every respect, and especially in that the poor along with their wives and children, were in slavery to the rich. All the land was in the hands of the few, and if men did not pay their rents, they themselves and their children were liable to be seized as slaves. The security for all loans was the debtor's person up to the time of Solon. He was the first champion of the people. So what that is pointing out is that one grievance that, was, uh, that the Athenians suffered during this time, and again, they won't be unique in this. We'll see this in, in ancient Rome as well. Um, and, and other city-states too, if you got into debt to an aristocrat, whether for a loan or for rents or what have you, you, you got sold into slavery. That was, that was the, you were the body of the, per, the debtor was the surety of the debt. That was abolished by Solon. Um, now, interestingly enough, if an aristocrat owed money to someone who wasn't an aristocrat, uh, do, do you reckon they got sold into slavery? No, no. One rule for them, different rule for everyone else. Um, I put a lot more in the notes about rivalries between different factions. There was a lot of debt as well that seems to have accrued during this time. Now this coincides roughly with the use, the first use of minted coinage. Prior to this period, there were weights of, of metals used. Um, so, so gold and silver is being used to trade, uh, but coinage as a concept really comes into being. It's, it's derived from the Lydian kingdom in Asia Minor, we think. Uh, that seems to have been the origin of it. So, um, and of course, you can imagine who's getting into debt to whom. It's the poor getting in debt to the rich. One of the things that Solon does is abolish all debts. He cancels the debts. Um, and this is referred to as the sesak thea, the shaking off of burdens. So it's a, a great reset. All debts are canceled. Uh, we start again. Um, and, he, and then he, re he divides up the, uh, the classes as well. He, again, it's based on income. You can see that in the notes. Uh, you have the, the 500 bushel men, the 300 to 500 bushel men. So the 500 bushel men are the aristocrats. The, the 3 to 500 are, or over 500 is, is, is them. 3 to 500 is the knights. Um, 2 to 300 bushels, this is refers, refers to produce, equivalent in produce, whatever their, their value is. A bushel is just a unit of weight or volume, uh, but, but it's, in this case, referring to how much they own, it's their property. That class, two, three, 
two to three hundred were called the Zugatai, um, and they're kind of like the common people. And then below them are the Thetes, 200 bushels, uh, who are the lowest rank. And then below them would be those who don't have any income at all. Um, and the Thetes were initially excluded from, the lowest class was excluded from engaging in the government. But the most democratic reform that Solon instituted was to make it possible for any citizen who had been who had received judgment at the hands of the aristocratic courts. They were all aristocratic courts at that point. He sets up a new court system uh, called the Heleia, uh, which is a court of the people, the people's court. And any decision rendered by an aristocratic court could be appealed to the people's court with, with them being able to overrule it. So in practice, in time, the people's court came to dominate. Since any decision could be appealed to them, they became the main court system. So arguably, that was the most democratic reform that Solon introduced. Um, the next sort of reformer I'm going to talk about is Pisistratus. Um, again, 6th century. He comes just after Solon, in fact. But he's a tyrant. He seized power unconstitutionally in Athens. Um, but but he seems to have been a pretty good tyrant, which, which is bizarre, maybe too up for us to think about. He's the one who institutes the Panathenaic festival. Um, and, and it's during his reign that the first definitive uh, edition of Homer is published. He uh, embarks on building programs uh, and, 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 and you know, constructs roads and things like that for the city. Um, At any rate, so he, he gets ousted from office actually twice <laughs> um, and, and manages to come back. And his sons will inherit uh, his kingdom like a proper monarchy, Hipp Hippias and Hipparchus. As I say, Pisistratus is considered a pretty good ruler, despite having taken power illegally. His sons are regarded less so. They're seen as, as grasping and, and tyrannical. They get overthrown. Um, with the help of the Alcmeonidae family, a group of nobles, one group of nobles ousts them um, and by bribing the Delphic Oracle, apparently, to get the Spartans to help liberate Athens, which is an interesting story in and of itself and well worth reading about. Uh, so Hippias and Hipparchus are ousted. They, they'll end up going to the Persians, by the way, and spending the rest of their days in Persia, longing to return to Athens, with the Persians, you know, using them as sources of intelligence and promising to restore them once they take over Athens again, because that's what the Persians do. They they get the aristocrats on side and have them govern their their subjects for them. The next major reformer is Cleisthenes. I've mentioned him already. Um, late sixth, early fifth century, and again a noble. Um, he's credited with reforming the constitution of ancient Athens and, and setting it firmly on a, on a democratic footing. And I've, I've gone a little bit over some of his contributions already. I'll just mention a few more. Um, he, he, as I say, he divides the city. The, the old, there was a lot of infighting, a lot of revenge murders taking place between the, the tribes, and the tribes were often aligned with one or another aristocrat. He does away with tribes altogether. And I think I've said before, his a citizen's surname came from their tribe, um, and that identified them as a member of this or that clan. Because of the redistricting of Athens, now people will be called by their deem, by the district in which they live. So it does away altogether with the old tribal system. Um, he reforms the court system as well, in increasing the number of jurors um, and allows the boule to propose laws for the assembly, so giving the boule that function of setting the agenda for the assembly. He also may have introduced the practice of ostracism, uh, whereby a vote of more than 6,000 of the citizens would mean that any citizen uh, so named would, would have to be go into exile for 10 years. So it, there was never a list of names. It was, shall we have a vote for ostracism? Yes, okay, if 6,000 citizens vote, for one name, whoever that is, they have to leave the city for 10 years. And the idea is that if someone is trying to set themselves up, up as a tyrant, um, then the citizens will know who it is and that they'll 
they'll vote that person out. They're not, they don't lose their property, they just have to leave for 10 years. Um, under the system, the exiled man's property was maintained, um, but he was not allowed physically in the city. Cleisthenes referred to these reforms as isonomia, which means something like equality under the law. Uh, previously, there had been the concept of eunomia, good rulership. This is what the aristocrats claimed to do. Now it's isonomia, equality under the law. Um, the last reformer I'll mention is, is Pericles, I'll, 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 who are Hermodius and Aristogaton. You'll see them in the slide. These were aristocrats who, who basically killed, um, I say Hippias and Hipparchus, uh, killed one of them, Hipparchus, who, who had raped his sister. It was, an, it was an aristocratic fight, but they're hailed as great democratic heroes. It caused Hippias to have to flee Athens uh, or, or facilitate that at any rate. So they're, they're hailed by the democracy as, as tyrant slayers, even though that wasn't really what was going on at the time, and statues of them were put up in the Agora. I was going to mention Pericles, his name literally means surrounded by glory. Um, he's the de facto president of Athens during the 5th century, during the middle of the 5th century, though they have no such role. He essentially dominates the assembly. He can always seem to get the assembly to vote how he wants. So he's like the, like a prime minister, I suppose, is, is perhaps a good way to think of him. He was a general, he was an elected general, but th that's all he was officially, unofficially, he was the ruler of Athens. Um, and he instituted a number of reforms, including promoting the arts and literature. Um, probably the most famous of his reform was the reforms was the building program. So he uses money from Athens League, the defense league set up to defend against the Persians with many other city-states contributing to it to rebuild the city of Athens and, and the Parthenon, all the buildings on the Acropolis Hill, uh, redoes the Agora, you know, gives it a, makes Athens really the jewel of the ancient world, um, and starts treating Athens' allies more as subjects as well. So it's, it's really under Pericles that the Athenian Empire takes off. He can also be characterized as a populist and a demagogue, um, a person who, who convinces people to vote a certain way by his clever speaking. He was very good at that. He was also politically hawkish um, and pursued the war with Sparta, even when perhaps, um, in, in, when perhaps they shouldn't have done. Thucydides, who was both a, an admirer and critic of Pericles, maintains that Athens was in name a democracy, but in fact governed by its first citizen. Uh, Probably his most visible legacy was to be found in the literary and artistic works of the Golden Age, which is associated with him. But um, amongst other things, too, he also uh, instituted pay for um, jurors. So, so you know, as with and, and, and for the, and for attending the boule as well. So, as with um, that, you know, because people were limited with the amount of time they could spend either with, or working for the government or being jurors on trials, paying them, and it's just, an, an, basically, for the jurors, it was enough money to buy food and drink for a day, but, um, on, on each occasion, but, you know, it meant that, that, that people who couldn't perhaps otherwise afford to do that then could participate in the democracy. For many older people, with, without a source of income, that would have been like their pensions, so um, it was considered a, a, a beneficial democratic reform. We'll talk more about Pericles in time to come, uh, although worth pointing out, it is thought that his, his wife, Aspasia, may have written most of his speeches for him and may have actually been behind most of his policies as well, and that will come to her when we, we think about gender in Athens. So that's... kind of long road to Athenian democracy um, with, with increasing power to the people. Let's talk about some democratic shortcomings. Um, one of them 
has to do with, with Athens being subject to demagoguery. So what's a demagogue? This is a person who is a very good public speaker, able to convince citizens to vote a certain way, not always in their interest, um, and sometimes against their interest. Athens would, seems to have been particularly subject to the rhetoric and propaganda used by demagogues. They're, they're often nationalistic type individuals appealing to populist and religious themes to get their way. Uh, arguably, well, Pericles is certainly one. Cleon is another one. We'll be looking at him more closely um, and Hyperbolus as well. But they, they, that seems to have been a feature of democracy that demagogues were able to when we dominate the assembly. Um, another aspect, um, most modern democracies, and I've said this before in, in, in seminar, I'll repeat it for the lecture, most modern democracies have what's called a foreign policy executive, you know, along with some kind of cabinet or, or secretariat or something that, that deals with complex political decisions, you know, obviously it's staffed by elected politicians, but these are experts in areas that ordinary citizens aren't. Um, Athens didn't really have this government by experts. And, and because the roles, especially the roles in the boule, rotated, and, and, and you know, the, being president of the steering committee of the boule was like it lasted for about a week uh, before it changed to somewhere else. It meant there weren't, there weren't really, and some people, would, you'd be banned as well from, from serving in the same position twice. Uh, it meant that experts were kind of few and far between um, and the experts tended to be like populist demagogues who dominated so political decisions foreign policy decisions were voted on by the assembly we'll be looking carefully at the Melian dialogue um, where essentially the assemblies decided to uh, destroy the city and the Mytilene debate as well where they, they initially decide to destroy Mytilene on Lesbos for rebelling from the league of Delos, um, but then changed their mind, having been convinced that you know that it was a wrong decision to do, which you know a democracy can change its mind. Uh, they, they they end up sparing them. But we'll look at the Sicilian expedition as well. This is where uh, two prominent politicians, uh, essentially, well, uh, two factions are trying to, are both arguing for and against invading Sicily during the middle, during a peace period uh, during the Peloponnesian Wars. There was no real reason to do it, arguably, apart from maybe seizing its assets and its grain. Um, they are convinced, though, that by, by Alcibiades in particular, a, a demagogue in general, that they can do it. So the long and the short of it is they launched the biggest naval expedition in history um, that we know of and go to attack Sicily but then botch it because they would they recall arguably it might never have been carried out to begin with but they recall the one man who might have actually been able to uh, successfully pull it off due to his political enemies rallying uh, the population against him and replace him with someone less competent so it's a botched expedition something like 40,000 people lost their lives um, and, and that's a good illustration of the kind of shortcomings. We'll look at some others that, that the democracy had. Very briefly, I want to introduce wasps and assembly women. Um, you're probably going to struggle a bit with the play Wasps. What it's about is one of these demagogues named Cleon, who is particularly good at getting older men, veterans from you know the, the war with Persia the, the the heroes of Marathon who are quite elderly at this point getting them to vote the way he wants Cleon is is accused of of by sources at the time stalking the courts with with his supporters and getting them to prosecute people he didn't like uh, in addition to dominating the assembly he's a hawkish politician and and again arguably the war is continued unnecessarily on account of his policies. Aristophanes didn't like him and so the play is about one of his followers um, and how ridiculous he is. Assembly Women happens after the Peloponnesian Wars and it's a kind of almost an exasperated way of saying look we've tried everything else why not let the women be in charge and see what will happen. He's not actually suggesting that but he, it's the inversion of the norm is used for comedic purposes. But we'll talk about those and how they reflect democracy and democratic politics in the seminar.
Thank you very much for your attention. That concludes our discussion today.